me a book, and I read that book, and I didn't put it down almost until I finished it except to go to sleep. <laughs> well, thanks. Uh, I guess that's a, that's a good sign. <laughs> well, I had to keep going back to it. <laughs> Even if I did go to bed, I had to go back to it until I finished it because, I mean, there's just so much in there and so many different uh, theories. And I'll be honest with you, I delved into the uh, Men in Black before myself on the Internet, but I don't think I came up with quite all that information that you came up with, and I was like, wow. But you go to the newspapers and uh, actual uh, actually talk to the people that were involved if they're still alive and, you know, things of this nature. Am I correct? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think a lot of people, when it comes to the Men in Black, their perceptions are sort of largely created out of the, the Men in Black films, you know, with Tommy Lee Jones and Will Smith. The idea that the Men in Black are just solely government investigators running around the country silencing UFO witnesses. And as I point out in the book, you know, that there's no doubt that that is a part of the Men in Black puzzle. But the weirder thing is that there seems to be several aspects to the Men in Black. In other words, you know, it's not a case of who are the Men in Black. It's more of a case of which Men in Black are you talking about. There seems to be several categories. And you know, also a lot of people have kind of assumed that the Men in Black mystery is very much like a historical one, you know, going back to the 40s and 50s and 60s, and that's where it begins and ends, without a kind of realization that in in reality that it's, it's a very much an ongoing phenomenon, not just one of the past. And so when I decided to sort of write the book and, and readdress the mystery of the Men in Black, you know, I felt that if I'm going to do that, you know, I've got to go back and speak to the people who are still around, who who were around, still around now, who were around back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. You know, get their views on record, ask them about some of the classic cases and what they thought of them and the people involved at the time, and equally importantly, point out to people that there are as many many black cases going on today as there were, you know, in the past. Um, it's, it's sort of like a misconception that the many blacks simply went away. They didn't. I think what's happened is that a lot of the cases have just gone under the radar today because people are kind of reluctant about talking about them. So that's what I tried to do was sort of correct that balance and try and get people to speak out about, you know, more modern-day cases as well as the older ones. Which would also give you a better look at them as you could get more to go on. I mean, I noticed that in in your book you were noticing that uh, the men in black that were in one category actually had an M.O., that might differ from a, a men in black from a different category, uh, like they each had their own agenda, for example. Yeah, that's right. And I think, you know, the, the, this is one of the most important things that I can think, I can stress to people is that, you know, the men in black aren't just this or that. You know, there seems to be several categories of MIB. Um, and certainly, you know, the, the one that everybody thinks of is the government angle. And as I point out in the book, there's absolutely no doubt that some men in black, you know, are government agents who, because particularly in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, you know, they wore black suits. They wore the typical fedora, Homburg-type hats, you know, that you would see in old films with, you know, Frank Sinatra or Humphrey Bogart, Bogart or whatever, you know. So that they kind of look like the part of the MIB. Um, and there's no doubt, you know, that some of the MIB reports and stories and legends can be traced back to government agents. You know, I do point that out in the book. There's some, there's some cases you can actually prove they were government personnel because the documents are surfaced through the Freedom of Information Act. But as well as the regular kind of government MIB, the more prevalent ones are far stranger. They're kind of described as usually sort of five feet to five feet, t- five, feet five tall, very pale face, skinny, almost anorexic looking. Um, you know, white to the point of seeming anemic almost. Um, the reports of them wearing, it sounds crazy, but wearing sort of badly fitting wigs and makeup to try and make the face look more pink like and, and healthy. Um, and they don't seem conversant with our ways and customs very much. And, and in many respects, when you listen to the stories from the witnesses, it actually sounds like this particular breed of MIB are almost alien themselves, but to the point where they look kind of like us and with a few subtle camouflage things here and there you know they can move amongst us now in saying that there's then a third category where they sound more paranormal 
where you know and supernatural they don't even sound completely flesh and blood they have these sort of occult overtones to them almost almost where people who have experiences with the MIB report poltergeist activity in the house days later or the MIB literally appear and vanish in the blink of an eye things like this so so in other words I don't think there's one brand of MIB I think the phenomenon itself is sort of made up of a whole variety of phenomena some of which might be interlinked and in some cases I think the government may have actually exploited the weirder men in black mythology as a means to cover their own tracks so this is why it becomes so confusing and convoluted if you like so you know pretty much basically uh, I get the impression from listening to you and reading your book that in your opinion you feel like uh, at least as far as the ones that the government are concerned with or where they have an involvement uh, they're not really maybe perhaps so much interested in uh, trying to put a stop to UFO investigation or uh, even really to cover it up so much as to um, maybe highlight it or maybe put their own angle on it or, or keep it going for ulterior motives maybe, or, or am I misunderstanding that? You mean the men in black? Mythology? Yeah. Yeah, I think what's happened with some, uh, certainly with, there's no doubt with some uh, men in black cases where it comes to the government, I think, the government, there's absolutely no doubt that government agencies know there's a weird and many black mystery because one of the things I include in the book is a very important document which shows how in the 1960s the Air, U.S. Air Force circulated throughout the entire Air Force a document stating that it had come to their attention that there were strange people running around the country impersonating government agents and silencing witnesses to, the, to UFOs and, and the government wanted to know who they were. So ironically, you know, you have this situation where those of us in the UFO community back then thought the men in black were the government. And now we find official documents showing that the government was sitting around asking, who are the men in black? So I think what's happened is that over time, the government, to protect its tracks and, its, and to cover its activities when it comes to their covert investigations of people in the UFO research community, I think they've actually exploited and utilized this weird and many black motif to the point where government personnel may actually have, you know, sort of worn the strange makeup as it bizarre as it sounds and the badly fitting wigs and, you know, acted really strange, but as a means to get information out of people. But also, by doing that, it kind of ensures that people won't speak out because the stories sound so weird. And, you know, that, that covers their tracks far better than turning up you know, flashing an official Pentagon ID card or whatever, where it would be easy to track the person down. So I think the government is happy to promote the weirder MIB angle because, you know, it, it serves a purpose of camouflage from their perspective if they try and exploit it and use it. Right. You know, that kind of reminds me of a uh, man named Jack Smith that I know that used to always tell me when I worked for him that he never told a lie where the truth fit better. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, that's it's not right, exactly you know. the same, but it kind of brings it to mind. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, you know, this is government agencies from a, like a psychological war pers warfare perspective are very good at sort of using and exploiting mythology and folklore as a means to, you know, um, perpetrate a particular aim or goal. In this case, collecting information but giving away nothing about your real identity but couching that real identity in something that's so bizarre that people just won't believe it if you mention it. Right. Or not a, coming out and saying you're a man in black, but leading you to believe they're one. Yes, but the, the important thing is that they've based their imagery, if you like, on existing reports of these legitimately mm. very strange men in black that I think they're still trying to track down who they are properly. Yeah, and I remember in your book you was mentioning and just a minute ago you said it too, that a lot of this had its start way back in the nineteen forties, I believe it was. I remember reading it was really pretty close to the uh, Kenneth Arnold and uh Roswell accounts it's about the same time the men in black were just about to start being born or, or close to it, is it isn't it? Yeah, that's right. I mean in you know, in this sort of post-1947 era with Boswell, Kenneth Arnold, things like that, a lot of people, not just the government, but a lot of people, you know, in the, in, the, in the general public got involved 
um, in UFO research. One of those who took a, a deep interest in UFOs in the early years was a man named Albert Bender, who grew up in Bridgeport, uh, Connecticut. And Bender developed a, a deep interest in UFOs, sort of post Kenneth Arnold, etc. And it culminated in the early 1950s when he set up a UFO group um, in Bridgeport called the International Flying Saucer Bureau. And the IFSB actually grew to proportions that I'm pretty sure even Bender himself never really anticipated the group reaching. I mean, it, it really sort of captured people's imaginations to the point where not only in the U.S. did, it, did his group receive massive coverage and subscriptions, but even had chapters in Australia and England and all wow. over the place. And so he got so pretty big. <laughs> oh, yeah. But what was even weirder was that although the group sort of reached massive heights, so to speak, um, not too long after he formed the group, he suddenly closed it down without warning and alluded to a number of close friends and colleagues in the research field that he'd been visited by three guys in black suits who silenced him, told him the truth about the UFO phenomenon, but warned him never to reveal the facts on the understanding that he'd get out of UFO research, which is, which is actually what he did for a long time. He just came back briefly in the mid early 60s to sort of set the record straight as to what happened. But what first happened was that one of the people who was friends and a colleague of Bender was a man named Gray Barker, who was an author um, living in West Virginia at the time. And Barker wrote a book in 1956 called They Knew Too Much About Flying Saucers, which part of the book covered the silencing of Bender by these three men in black. And in the book, although it's not specifically stated, it's alluded, the illusion is the idea that Bender was silenced by elements of the government. But in 1962, six years after Barker's book came out, Bender kind of surfaced from the shadows again to tell his own story uh, in a book called Flying Sources and the Three Men. And in that book, Bender says that, you no, know, the three men that silenced him weren't government people. They actually sound far stranger. I mean, for example, he talks about how when his UFO research was at its height in the early 1950s, he started realizing that people were watching him, these shadowy, dark-suited entities, but they weren't anything like government people. For example, he talks about going to the cinema to watch movies on a, you know, late on a Saturday night, and the way he describes the cinema in his little town in Bridgeport, you know, sort of a solitary place and weren't many people there. And he talks about seeing these strange, almost wraith-like, shadowy figures materializing in the cinema, in dressed completely in black, but they seem to have, like, illuminated, glowing eyes. And they, they come across more like something straight out of a vampire movie than they do, you know, sort of out of the Pentagon. And he talks about having these experiences with these weird MIB and how they literally manifested in the house he was living at at the time and essentially kind of rendered him into an altered state of mind and then threatened him with, with silence and then sort of vanished, quite literally vanished, you know, in, into nothingness. So if Bender's story wasn't made up out of, you know, nothing at all, then clearly we're not dealing with government people. We are looking at something, something far, far stranger and, and more ominous and, you know, even with paranormal overtones. That's what a lot of people don't realize is that the early years of men in black law, if you like, and mythology, have nothing to do really with government agents, but everything to do with paranormal activity and glowing-eyed men in black and these weird creatures just appearing and vanishing, you know, literally winking in and out of existence. It was only later, particularly in the 70s and 80s, that it became sort of more mutated is probably a, a, the correct word. More. <laughs> and began to think of it just as government agents and nothing else. Well, yeah, that would be a pretty, uh, you know, varied uh, metamorphosis uh, from government, I mean, from uh, paranormal to government agent, which has very little to do with it. But, you know, um, I think Scuttlebutt has a lot to do with that as well. Oh, you're right. I think what happened is that, you know, from the 50s and 60s, if you look back from the period when people like Barker in the, in the 50s and John Keel, Brad Steiger in the 60s were looking in men in black cases, you know, their writings from that period, you find the stories of these very weird men in black. But then as the 70s went on, it was almost like that particular group of men in black went underground and their activities became more covert. And the government stepped up its involvement 
but realise, you know, as I said, they could use the, the Men in Black Mystery as a cover to protect their activities when they wanted to go out and interview people. And so that's why the, the government side then became more prevalent and people assumed that's what it had always been all along, when in reality, you know, the, the truth is very different. You know, the truth is usually a little different than what's actually put out there. It's usually yeah. somewhere between the lie and the actual truth. I mean, uh, you know, the the middle of the spectrum. <laughs> um, but um, I was going to say I noticed that you've also, in your book, talked to um, several people that are, uh, well, some of them are just everyday witnesses that, uh, you know, they're not authors, they're not researchers, they're not, you know, uh, anything to do with the uh, paranormal community, at least not until they actually have some form of activity. But you also talk to other researchers like yourself that's uh, delved into this. And from what I've learned in reading your book, is the, uh, not just uh, the average everyday Joes or people just new to the uh, UFO phenomena, but people that's been studying it for some time have had uh, these kind of experiences. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is one of the important things, you know, I wanted to stress to people when I was writing the book. I didn't want to just write a book, you know, that gave, um, you know, kind of like a, an overview of everything that we'd heard before. You know, that's kind of cheating the reader to, to do something like that. Um, so what I did was to sort of seek out new cases, but also do extensive interviews with people like Brad Steiger, um, you know, who've been a, a long-term uh, player in the UFO and paranormal scene to get their views and memories of people who were around way back in the early to mid-60s, like John Keel uh, and people like Gray Barker. And, you know, so I could really have get the insight of someone who had been involved back then. But equally importantly, you know, it was important to go to the, the witnesses because, you know, arguably, you know, you can forget forget authors or journalists or whatever, Without the witnesses, you know, there is no UFO phenomenon. They're the most important people in the subject because they're the ones who who have the accounts to relate to us that we have to work with. So, you know, I, fe I felt that's why it was important to speak with the witnesses. And one of the things that, you know, even surprised me to an extent was the sheer number of sort of post-1990s reports of MIB that I got hold of. Um, you know, sort of very strange reports. I mean, a... A classic one um, came from a woman named Claudia Cunningham, Cunningham, who only a couple of years ago um, had an experience with the man in black. She had a friend um, who lived near the Albany Rural Cemetery, just outside Albany, New York, and she had a and her friend had a very weird um, experience of a typical man in black encounter, actually in the cemetery itself. And ironically, the cemetery is actually the rest of the final resting place of Charles Fort, who was an early chronicler of strange activity. He wrote a number of books in the early part of the 20th century, and he's a man after whom the magazine 14 Times is named. And um, But when um, Claudia's friend told her about this experience with the men in black in the cemetery, Claudia, who has an interest in the paranormal anyway, was like, wow, you know, I'd really like to learn more about the men in black and, you know, understand who they are. And what happened was that she then found herself confronted by the men in black. And it was clearly, you know, some sort of experience where it seems that when she went looking for the MIB, it was almost as if she popped up on their radar and they realized someone was looking and kind of made like a veiled, kind of like a veiled threat. There was no sort of, there was no language involved, no speaking, but it was one of these guys literally appeared before her while she was coming out of a, a out of a store buying food and he kind of gave like a knowing nod in her direction and kind of a weird creepy smile and he was dressed in the classic men in black outfit even down to the hat um, and Claudia said you know she actually felt that there was something paranormal about this man or this being to where it was like you know he was saying to her you wanted to find out more about us hey here I am and she actually now takes the view that they're far more paranormal and, you know, malevolence than, than anything, you know, that would come out of the government. And uh, that case was just a couple of years ago, and that's sort of typical of a lot of the stories that I included in the book, that, you know, yes, it's the men in black, but, it, you know, the people describe the incidents as being sort of very creepy rather than just, you know, somebody flashing an ID card and, and intimidating you or whatever. Right. Now, also, you know, I've noticed in here 
that Timothy, uh, Timothy Beckley uh, got a picture. I think it's Timothy Beckley Green, Mr. UFO, is known as, uh, got a picture of a man in black. And I think there was somebody else you mentioned that got a picture of a man in black, wasn't there? Yeah, I mean, th- this is one of the strange things about the men in black is that they're very elusive. You know, people have said they've been around their houses and, you know, when they've left the house, um, the person's gone to the front door and thought to themselves after, why on earth did I let that person in? You know, and then when they've opened the front door, after they, seconds after they've left, the MIB is just completely missing, just gone as if they've dematerialized. And so... And even the Air Force, as I pointed out, circulated memoranda in the 1960s, official documentation, showing that, um, you know, the um, the men in black was so elusive, even the government couldn't find them. But one of the things I point out in the book is that, you know, although we haven't sort of physically captured a man in black, there are a number of cases on record where people have reportedly photographed them. Now, two of these occurred actually very close together, one in 1968 and one in 1969. The 68 case is the one that involves Tim Beckley and with our fellow researcher, Jim Mosley, who's still on the scene today. Jim publishes it like Tim. Tim, you know, does a lot of book publishing, and Jim publishes a, a magazine or newsletter called Source of Smear. And the story goes back um, to a woman named Mary Robinson, who in 1968, um, her husband, Jack, he was a well-known UFO researcher in the New York area. And the, what had happened is at the height of his research, the family began to get weird telephone interference. Um, uh, Jack reported how some of his files had apparently been rifled and looked through when he'd been out of the house because he had a set place for everything and that when he got home, somebody had been tampering with his files. Yeah, like and, me. Yeah, well, you know, a lot of people do get this. And Mary took, Mary had a deep interest in the paranormal, and she realized on a number of occasions in 1968, over the course of several days when all this weird activity was going on, there was a weird guy dressed in black, even down to the sunglasses and the hat and the long coat, who was actually um, kind of watching the apartments um, that, they, that Jack and Mary were living in. He was sort of standing over the road, looking up at the apartment from the recesses of an old doorway in a building opposite um, their apartment. And he was there literally just every day, just standing there, stone-faced, almost like a zombie, as that, how Tim described him, sort of very ominous and chalky-faced and white, etc. cetera. Um, and Mary told Tim Beckley and Jim Mosley about this, you know, that this guy was there each day over the course of four or five days. And, you know, the sort of the realization then hit Tim and Jim, you know, well, why, if that's a real man in black, why don't we get out there and, you know, look for him and see if he's there? And that's exactly what Tim and Jim did. You know, they went over there in the morning at the time when Mary said he could be seen. And sure enough, the guy was there, sort of in the shadows of the doorway, looking very pale, sort of zombie-like, totally unemotional, just staring up at Jim and, uh, excuse me, at um, Mary's apartment. And so while Jim slowed the car down very slow, um, Tim quickly whipped out the camera and took a photograph of him, which uh, Jim was kind enough, because it was Jim's camera, to let me use in the book. And he does sort of look almost like a, a weird character in a trance, just staring upwards. Um, so, you know, that, that's one example. Another example is a photograph taken by a man named Alan Greenfield. Alan is a, um, has extensively researched the man in black and had his own experience to relate. So, again, I interviewed him, did a brand new interview with him for the book. And he told me how, you know, he'd had an experience with this MIB watching him, and he confronted him on the street, took a photograph, which, again, I reproduced in the book, and the guy's got the hat, the sunglasses, the outfit, etc. cetera. Um, and the man then sort of ducked around the corner, just literally around the corner of the street. When Alan went running around there to confront him again, he'd literally vanished. There was just no sign of him, and nowhere, more importantly, for him to have gone. It was just, as Alan said, you know, just a very surreal, creepy experience. So, you know, we have at least two photographs reputedly of the MIB, both involving MIB, who, after they were photographed, seemingly vanished into thin air, which, you know, is sort of a an interesting pattern that it should have occurred in both cases. Okay. Now, uh, I still think it's a good thing that we at least have them on the record and, you know, if we can get them once, we could probably get them again. And who's to say there's not some reports? You you were mentioning earlier 
that it seems like the reports have petered out and people quit wanting to come forward. There could be some of those people who haven't come forward recently that I think might just have more pictures or who knows, maybe even some more vital information, something more telling. Yeah, yeah, I actually agree with you on that. I think what's happened is that one of the reasons why, you know, if you go back and you look at, um, like, for example, John Keel's book, The Mothman Processes, or Gray Barker's book on Mothman um, called The Silver Bridge, you know, when the Mothman sightings were going on in the 1960s, they were linked with a lot of men in black experiences. And a lot of people were actually quite, I wouldn't say happy, but, you know, they were willing to speak out about those events. Today, I think, you know, people are far more reticent and reluctant to discuss these cases. And I think one of the main reasons is because of the Hollywood movies. You know, it's like if you say you've seen, you've been visited by the men in black, people think, you know, you've overdosed on watching the men in black films with Tommy Lee Jones and Will Smith. You know, it's like, well, no, this is just a creation of Hollywood. A lot of people don't realize, you know, the movie itself or the movies were based on comic books called the men in black. And the, the comic books were inspired by these original stories of the MIB. So I think, you know, it, it's kind of like if you, if you say you've seen the MIB, people naturally do think you've just, you know, you've, you've mixed fantasy and facts because you've been watching too many reruns of the Men in Black films. So they prefer to stay silent rather than risk being called liars or whatever, or fantasists or mentally ill. And I think that's why, you know, we see a differentiation between the frequency of reports in the past and the present day. But I have found also, you know, when you find people like Claudia Cunningham um, who had modern-day experiences, you know, if you treat, when they understand you're willing to treat their stories with respect, you know, and, and just want to know what happened, you're going to re- report them accurately and treat the story seriously, then, you know, they're more willing to, to speak out. And, you know, that's what I found, and I think it's an important thing that the, you know, far from going away, I don't say there's any more MIB reports than there were in the 50s and 60s, but there's certainly no less today. It's just a matter of really, you know, digging them out is kind of tougher. But when we do, you know, as I said, we don't find anything less, any less significant than we did 40, 50 years ago. Right. Uh, Also, before I forget to mention it, you can get more information about Nick Redfern and this book as well as some of his other works he's done at www.nickredfern.com. And I make his books available on my site at paranormalpalaceradio.cz.cc, which is a bit of a tongue twister for me. And anybody that's interested, I'll be having a uh, discussion board for this at United per, uh, Paranormal International dot mean just go to the groups and click on ufo past and present and uh you'll find the forum for it in there uh of course you have to sign up for a free membership if you want to join the discussion but you can read it for free and see what other people are posting on it uh would love to have anybody here that wants to join in on that and nick if i'm not mistaken don't you have a forum at your site as well or am i thinking of something else um yeah, I do. Actually, my site's going through an update right now, but um, when when it's all figured out and updated, etc., yeah, there is a, there will be a new forum where people can contact me and sort of debate stuff and whatever. So. Oh, that sounds great. I always think a, a good debate uh, always great to have, and it, you know, you'd be surprised what you can learn out of one of those as long as you know people remember to respect each other and remember that we're here to learn, not to know or to teach. Yeah, and I think, you know, there's nothing wrong. You know, I enjoy a good heated debate, you know, but I think, you know, we need to sort of keep it in perspective that, you know, we're all looking for the same thing. We're all looking for the answers, you know. Okay. Now, one of the things that you mentioned in your book about men in black that I think very few people have actually thought about would be the uh, the possibility that they were time travelers. Yeah, that's right. I mean, this is one of the more intriguing theories for the men in black. You know, it's kind of like, as I said, everybody thinks of the government angle. Then you have the paranormal angle. Then you have other government people, you know, using the weird MIBs to collect, to protect their position, if you like, and camouflage themselves. But then there's another aspect, you know, the idea that they could be time travelers. Now, that sounds sort of bizarre and controversial, which it certainly is. You know, I don't dispute that. But there's one, of the, one particular reason why 
people have suggested, you know, that if time tra travel has merit, that the MIB might be some component of it. And the reason why that's come about is because in many of the Men in Black reports, there are two central facets. One is that they wear clothing that seems somewhat out of date. You know, they, they wear the black suits, which, you know, in, in many respects, you know, you, the people in governments and, and, and just business wear black suits. But the sort of fedora and Homburg-type hats they wear, you know, kind of really did go out in the mid-1960s onwards or whatever. You know, that you would kind of look twice if you're in your local shopping mall today and you saw somebody in that sort of typical, you know, rat pack era <laughs> clothing and hats, etc. And also, the men in black seem to drive, uh, often reported as driving old-fashioned cars, sort of like 1950s Lincolns and, you know, sort of shark fin tail cars, that sort of thing. Cadillacs. Cadillacs, yeah. You know, the sort of thing you would see in some sort of 1950s detective movie or something like that. Um, and this has led to speculation that the men in black, you know, the clothing seems out of time, the cars seem out of time. Is it possible, you know, that they're sort of future travelers come back and they're kind of screwed up in terms of, you know, accurately trying to determine the clothing and the cars for the 1990s and end up arriving, you know, in the sort of vehicles and clothing more suited to the 60s. Um, and, you know, a lot of the MIB don't seem fully conversant with our mannerisms, um, you know, how to ask the right questions. They seem, they act awkwardly as if everything about them is screaming, you know, out of time or out of place. Um, and, you know, so one of the people I interviewed for the book about this theme was a man named Josh Warren. Josh is a good friend of mine, and he has got a deep interest in the Men in Black mystery. And he asked the question, you know, why do they dress in black suits? Which is a fair question. You know, why don't we have men in white, men in yellow, you know, men in green, right. always men in black? And Josh came up with an interesting theory, the idea that if you are a time traveler from the future and you're coming back into the past for whatever reason, then if, you, you know, if you're coming back to, I don't know, 2025, 2010, 2011, 1985, 1960, 1940, 1920, then the, the black suit is one that you could actually use and not be overly noticed. In other words, even since the Flying Saucer mystery kicked off in 1947, if you're a time traveler who's coming back for some UFO-related project from 47 to the present day, you could wear a black suit and, you know, jump the timelines from 47 one day to 67 the next day to 2011 the day after that and wear the same suit and not be noticed. Yes, you might get a, two, you know, a second look if you're wearing the fedora, but for the most part, people wouldn't take notice. So, you know, I think that's kind of an interesting theory that, that Josh came up with, you know, that the men in black wear that suit because it serves their purposes across, you know, an entire century or more even. Um, well, yeah, because even when wearing black suits, uh, standardized for you, still to this day do. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, I think it's an in interesting thing. And when you combine that with the out-of-place cars, you know, the, the old-fashioned cars that look brand new, but that clearly nobody's driving nowadays apart from people, you know, who restore old cars and put them on display and things like that. You know, it, it does seem to me that uh, we should not dismiss this theory. Now, of course, much of it is dependent upon whether or not time travel is a reality, you know, and, and of course, to an extent at least, we're forced to speculate and, you know, on, on that as a hypothesis rather, as a, rather than a hard, fast rule. But I think it is important that, you know, we address this theory because at the end of the day, it, you know, there are aspects of it that make a great deal of sense. You know, I'll be the first to admit that. And also, you know, ruling out things that are possible just because they're unlikely is a good way to get hung with your britches down, I've found out. The very yeah, thing you yeah. think is the least likely is the very thing that it often is. Well, yeah, you're right. I mean, it's, you know, you go back 500 years, if you said the Earth was round, you'd be burned at the stake. You know, we know now the Earth is round, or most people <laughs> most people believe the Earth's round, a few don't. But, you know, it's kind of exactly the same sort of thing that, you know, people people used to say, well, there's no way you, we could ever land a man on the moon. Um, you know, people might say today, there's no way that time travel could be possible. Well, we only really say that because 
in the early 20th century, time travel for most people is seen as, you know, just something for the realm of science fiction. But, you know, who knows what the science of the 30th century or the 40th century, if we're still around, you know, might reveal. And if time travel has been perfected, you know, it might be an ideal situation where you would come back and present yourself kind of under like a, a UFO motif. You know, it's like if, say, in the 40th century, some a team of people want to come back to the present day, how would they kind of protect and camouflage themselves? Well, they look back in the history books and they find that in the 40s and the 50s, people were seeing UFOs and men in black, and they think, well, okay, then we'll present ourselves as aliens and we'll dress in black suits. And then the realization hits them that they're actually, they're actually talking about them. You know, they were responsible for creating the UFO mystery in the past as a means to come back. And so it gets into some sort of very weird mind-bending areas, but I think, you know, this is a good thing. We need to ask significant and mind-bending questions if we're going to get the answers to who the MIB really are. Right, and I think also, like you say, you need to challenge your belief system and, yeah. you know, remember that today's impossibilities are tomorrow's science facts. Uh, like you were talking about the sun, and that's not the only thing. The car, the airplane, there's many examples. Uh, also, I wanted to mention the fact that uh, on Joshua Warren now, are you referring to Joshua P. Warren? Yes, I am, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, while you were... Uh, Explaining that to us, I went to his website and got his link, and I'm pasting it into the uh, chat room. It's www.joshuapwarren.com. Yeah, Josh has done a lot of insightful ideas. You know, he's delved into a lot of areas of the paranormal, and I think, you know, this time travel goal of Josh is is getting a lot of interest because people are realizing it, it does seem to make a lot of sense. I think I sent him an email not long ago asking him to come on my show, and he replied, and I think said he was busy up through the end of summer. Yeah, uh, Josh does a lot of work on the road, a lot of TV work, so it's not, you know, he's not um, ignoring him. He's, you know, Josh does, he's, he's always out and about doing TV stuff like the Travel Channel and National Geographic and things like that. Uh, well, yeah, I can, you know, kind of figure that. If you look at his website, you can tell he's definitely a busy little beaver. Oh, yeah. But, uh, and that's good, you know, because that's the way to get answers, you know, just keep pushing the envelope for for results. Also, while I got you here today, Nick, I wanted to bring up this here, UFOs and aliens. Is anybody out there? And up at the top it says exposed uh, UFOs uncovered, I think. Let me put my glasses back on. I set them down for a second. Yeah, uncovered and declassified. This is a book that you and me talked about that, um, well, you got a chapter in it along with uh, Marie Jones and Kathleen Morden and Mikey Hanks and actually a bunch of people. I think some people might even have two chapters. I think Stanton Freeman has a a chapter or two in there uh, that you were telling me was uh, an idea put out by New Page Books, and you've got a chapter in it as well. Would you like to tell us a little something about that while we're here? Yeah, sure. Well, this is basically the first volume of, a, of an ongoing series of New Page books who also published my Real Men in Black book. And the basic theme of the first volume is UFOs, and then there's one coming out shortly, which is on ghosts. And then at the end of the year, there'll be a third one on ancient mysteries like Atlantis and the pyramids and things like that. Um, but the first volume is UFOs, and um, New Page um, invited a number of UFO-related authors to submit chapters for this anthology, and they asked me if I'd be interested, and I said, yeah, sure. And one of the, so what I did was to write a chapter on a case that I've been intrigued by for a long time. It's a UFO crash story that reportedly occurred in King, just outside Kingman, Arizona, um, in 1953. And the story was an interesting one because it actually has a lot of strands to it, a number of first and second-hand witnesses and um, references to government involvement, official files, of a deep cover-up, kind of like the Roswell story in the sense that, you know, one of the downsides of a lot of crash UFO stories is that they're simply just one witness accounts. Um, Doesn't mean they're not credible, but it just makes it more and more difficult to resolve them. Roswell, you know, we have countless witnesses and people who've testified that, you know, something clearly strange happened at Roswell. 
And that's the case with, with the Kingman story, that we have different strands of the story coming from different people. Um, and so basically what I did was to look at all the data, some of which actually pushes the story down a year, crashed UFO angle. Other data pushes it more down like a secret government military experiment using a prototype drone type aircraft that might have gone off range and crashed. Um, and it also interlinks with the contact team history, um, possibly an early contact team named Truman Beckham may have encountered the beings that reportedly killed in the crash. So it's, it's very much like an de ongoing detective story with a lot of strands and twists and turns to it that, you know, make it sound almost like a, a work of fiction until you realize, you know, that it's coming from on the record, retired military personnel, government files, you know, things like this and other researchers' data and their, and their case files to the point where there's no doubt in my mind that something did crash at Kingman. The big question is, you know, what it was, um, you know, and how we try and resolve it almost sort of 60 years on. <clears throat> you know, talking about that, uh, RD47, what he was uh, telling us about this was, uh, now this isn't even a question, but he was uh, making a statement that there was a crash in both Phoenix and in the Hopi res uh, Reservation in about 1947. So I just thought I'd bring that up and see if you were familiar with those. Um, I'm not personally familiar, but I mean, what, what I can tell you is, you know, everybody thinks, when everybody talks about crashed UFOs in 1947, everybody thinks of Roswell. But the reality is, I mean, you can find at least seven or eight reports from 47 of UFO crash stories that sound very credible. I mean, a friend of mine, Ryan Wood, wrote a book in 2005 called Magic Eyes Only. And that book includes, I think, probably maybe even nine or ten cases from 1947 in various parts of the U.S. where it seems that for whatever reason, a number of these things, whatever they were, came down. So, you know, I think, I think this is significant. And, um, you know, there's no doubt that there's a far bigger story about what the government knew about UFOs in 47 than, you know, than we, than we even realize today. You know, that much more, I think, has, has, has been lost to history and just buried in, you know, official archives somewhere. I think the people in the chat room would agree with you because now Emerald is saying there was another instance in Missouri about the same time but said it wasn't really investigated. So, you know, that makes well, you wonder... Actually, yeah, I, I do know, I, I don't know if it's the one they mean, but I do know of a Missouri story from 1941, a very significant one, um, where, again, something crashed. There were stories of strange bodies being found and FBI involvement and military involvement. And, um, you know, again, this is an important one because it isn't just reliant on one person. You know, a number of people have spoken about this and, um, you know, um, Family members have spoken about how their you know, grandfathers, et cetera, had involvement in the case. And, and again, I think like Kingman and Roswell, this is, you know, the more we dig into these stories, the more we turn up additional witnesses clearly pointing out that, you know, some sort of incident did occur. And I also, about the same time, I, I know most people are familiar with the Aurora, Texas incident as well. Yeah, I mean, actually, Aurora is only about a 40-minute drive from where I live. Uh, we, me and my wife live um, just halfway between Dallas and Fort Worth, and, you know, I can be in Aurora in about 40 minutes from, from me. And that's an interesting story that goes back to 1897 when a UFO reportedly crashed in the little town of Aurora, Texas. Um, and the story was that the, the, the UFO, which was kind of described as like a, almost like an airship-type craft, reportedly collided with a, a windmill in the town and the strange materials were found and that this unusual little body um, was found at the scene and, and reportedly buried in the um, Aurora Cemetery. And the, the Aurora Cemetery still exists to this day. And if you go there, there's a big um, sign outside that tells the story of the, the alien crash or the UFO crash and the story that, you know, the body was supposedly buried in the cemetery. And what's interesting is that although Aurora is a very tiny town, I mean, literally, you can blink, you know, and you've gone through it. I mean, I'm not exaggerating. Um, but the local police quite vigorously um, patrol the cemetery because over the years, a number of people, often under cover of darkness, have tried to 
you know, sort of dig up certain parts of the cemetery and determine, you know, where the body was or is, you know, if it's really there. And, you know, the, obviously the, the locals don't want people digging up bodies of their dead relatives looking for a dead alien. So, um, <laughs> you know, it's kind of an interesting, it's a bit of an interesting, weird little story, really. Yeah, it is. But, uh, you know, like you say, you can't really blame the townsfolk. They don't, uh, you know, it could really get way out of control. Yeah, I mean, and, and I think actually that's what their main concern is that, you know, it becomes sort of, it reaches sort of, I guess, like a hysteria point. But for the most part now, it's kind of died down. But there was a period when Aurora was really thrust back into the public eye that people were like, wow, you know, this is where the evidence could be. You know, let's go and dig up a few graves and <laughs> see what we can find. So. Okay, now we got about 11 minutes remaining. And I wanted to ask you if there's anything that I have not yet covered that you wanted to get, you know, put out there for all the listeners to hear. Um, well, that's a, a very good question. <laughs> um, well, you know, I, I think, you know, when it comes to sort of the men in black, I think, you know, I think the most important things are that, that I've tried to stress. One is that, you know, the, the mystery isn't just as many people perceive, it's just the government. And the other thing is it's not just a historical mystery you know it's one that goes on even to this very day and, and thirdly you know the, the phenomenon seems to have not just governmental overtones but paranormal and sometimes even like occult overtones to it as well that kind of spook and scare a lot of people and out of the subject and I think that's what happened with people like Albert Bender you know they realized that this wasn't just somebody flashing an ID card that this was a you know, just a, a, a really unearthly, weird, creepy phenomena that somehow was getting its grips to into them from a very negative perspective. And you know, this is one of the things I stress in the book. In the book, that it's dealing with the men in black is not like dealing with you know the FBI visiting your know, homeland security. It's you know, it's it's something far weirder and not to be sort of laughed at or scoffed at. It's the uh, you know, much, much stranger than that. Okay. Now, Nick, I've got to ask you this. Do you have anything upcoming in the near future, like any new books or research or, uh, uh, you know, uh, conferences or anything? Well, well, not so much directly coming up, but um, there's a conference in Los Angeles on the first weekend in October called the Conscious Life Expo, which I'll be speaking at on the on my new book, The Real Men in Black. That'll be, uh, as I said, the first weekend in October. And I think the website is consciouslifeexpo.com. Um, and then in December, this December, so roughly sort of about six months' time, a little bit less, I've got another book out, which is called Keep Out. And Keep Out is a study of secret government installations with links to UFOs like Area 51 and the... Um, alleged Hangar 18 at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. So in other words, it's a st each chapter is like a case-by-case a -case study of secret installations. And there's, there's chapters on things like the reported underground alien base at Dulce, New Mexico, um, chapters on the Russian Area 51 and the British Area 51, and sort of really delving into, instead of cases as such, but, you know, as I said, facilities from where all this top-secret research is being undertaken. Okay. Now, while you were explaining that, I went to the Conscious Life Expo, and I got their link, and I put it in here. And while I was at the webpage, I noticed that it's uh, September 30th through October 2nd. I'm like, I bet that's why Nick ain't going to the Taos uh, Symposium with Janet Saylor this year, like he usually does, because he's going to be at the uh, Conscious Life Expo instead. <laughs> yeah, Janet, um, Janet. I know Janet does want me to speak at one of her future events, and um, I'm not exactly sure when or where. But you know, I, I, I spoke at her event two years ago and had a great time. I went up there with Greg Bishop, and we sort of made a sort of road trip out of it, and um, you know, had a good time. And you know, there's it's actually, actually, I'm not just saying this. It was one of the, you know, the funniest. And, and sort of most rewarding conferences I've been at because, you know, the audience was very interactive, asked a lot of questions, very knowledgeable, you know, and for the entire weekend it was sort of a good, you know, hangout event and, um, you know, everybody learned a lot, I think, from all the different speakers, not just the speakers, but from the witnesses, you know, interacting and relating their accounts. And everybody was, 
you know, kind of hung out together. And it was more like a, you know, like a close-knit family environment almost, you know, where everybody felt comfortable about talking about their experiences and things like that. Well, one of the people that you know is a good friend of yours that's also in your Men in Black book that had a Men in Black experience herself, Reedy Jones, and uh, her friend Larry Flaxman, going to be at Janet's uh, symposium this year. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, and Marie's a good friend of mine. And, um, you know, again, this sort of demonstrates that it's not just witnesses to UFOs. It's actually authors themselves are having UFO, excuse me, MIB experiences. And Marie had this weird encounter uh, a number of years ago when um, she was doing a lot of research into alien abduction stories. And at the height of her abduction research, she hooked up with a, a fellow researcher in um, South California, where Marie still lives to this day. And what basically happened was that both Marie and this researcher, um, who'd had abduction experiences and abduction research, um, they began having weird encounters with the men in black themselves. Marie's friend would talk about how her and her husband would, you know, they'd look out the window at night and see these sh shadowy silhouetted forms, you know, sort of standing just staring at the house. Marie began to get intimidating and weird phone calls from people who it sounded like were actually watching her every movement in the house at that particular time to where they could even tell her, you know, what book was sitting on her living room table or whatever. You know, very intimidating things like this. And there were sort of semi-veiled threats that are what could happen to people who delve too much into abductions. And and it really was like a, a blitz of intimidation to the point where eventually both Marie and her friend decided, you know, enough's enough, and they quit the abduction research uh, and left the scene. Uh, now, Marie obviously didn't leave the paranormal scene. You know, she's still heavily involved to this day. But oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but she did get out of the abduction work, which was causing these many black incidents. And, you know, Marie told me that, you know, it was it was something that really created a massive amount of stress to the point where, you know, she felt that something really was watching her. You know, it was almost like the entire house was being spied on 24 hours a day and her every movement was being watched. And she just could not take it anymore and just said, you know, that's it, I'm done. So, again, it demonstrates how you know Intimidating. the sheer potency of the you know the, the presence and threats of the men in black the effect they can have on people oh yeah now i gotta be the first one to tell you i know marie jones about as well as i know you and there is one woman that is as kind and as sweet a woman as you'd ever want to meet and as honest and forthcoming very highly intelligent woman. you're not talking the kind of lady that would uh imagine things in other words uh she's very spiritually uh advanced i mean in depth and you know you know for her to have had that kind of experience i, I think to me says a lot oh yeah i mean you know um marie you know is a very good writer she's a very logical you know forthright person you know with a good solid head on her shoulders you know but for even for marie this was just something totally out of the box you know that she'd never experienced before and i think from speaking to her certainly doesn't ever want to experience again either. Yeah. Well, I can imagine not. Now, we got three minutes, almost four minutes left. And, Nick, I almost forgot to ask you about what you thought was, the, or at least what I thought from reading your book, you thought to be the uh, one of the most likely of the uh, most common uh, men in black categories, the uh, Topla. You think you can give us a quick briefing on that? Yeah, sure. Well, well tulpas basically are a, sort of a Tibet, something that comes out of sort of Tibetan law. And the idea is, a, t a tulpa essentially is what's known as a thought form. The idea is that the human mind, you know, if you focus on one particular piece of potent imagery and, you know, you meditate on it for days and weeks, um, you know, let's just say, for example, you know, somebody dreams or focuses on the image of like a large wolf with glowing red eyes, shall we say. And then three weeks later, the local media reports on how, you know, somebody you know, five miles away saw this huge wolf cross the road in front of them with glowing red eyes. But the idea is that the human mind, if you create and focus on an image in, that, in your mind, you can actually externalize that image to where it has some semblance of reality. In other words, it's kind of like giving birth to a monster of the mind rather than physically giving birth. 
um, and you know it has some sort of semblance of reality outside of human imagination but it's like human imagination comes to life and a number of people who I interviewed for the book suspected one being Chris O'Brien an author of a book called Stalking the Trickers Strict, excuse me tr- Stalking the, the Trickers yeah who felt that some of the men in black could be tulpas the idea that the human mind has this archetypal imagery of you know mysterious people dressed in black and that the potency of that imagery might actually sort of shock out of our imagination a quasi semi real thought form that has some sort of existence in the real world you know it can literally stride out of our imagination and that's why they seem so weird because they're sort of temporary constructed life forms that have sort of a limited lifespan um, and that are based on our willingness and our subconscious belief in them, if you like, to where, you know, they temporarily exist uh, before winking out of existence, before somebody else then, you know, picks upon that archetypal imagery again and, and brings them back into reality. So it's a very strange scenario and, and theory, but it also makes a lot of sense in terms of the weird aspects of the MIB, how they do seem to sort of wink in and out of reality and not be, or not, it seems to be sort of temporary constructs rather than, you know, living entities in their own right. Right. And, you know, it makes a lot of sense to me too. I, and, you know, it could be like you said in your book or indicated in your book, some are this, some are this, and some are this, and you got a kind of a pot pourri going on there. Uh, yeah, I don't think one thing more than the other. I think there could be three or four at least categories for men in black rather than just one. Now, we've got 42 seconds left. I was just going to mention real quick, I also noticed that Colin Bennett was in your uh, book as well, and uh, that stuck out because he's coming up on my show in the near future. Oh, cool. Well, actually, um, I've been trying to contact Colin to get him so I can send him the book to, to get his address. So if you speak to him, can you please ask him to email me? So with my with his address, so I can actually mail him a copy of the book as a thank you. Sure. Now we're talking about the same one with that, that wrote the book Flying Saucers over the White House, uh, aren't we? Yeah. yeah okay. Yes. Both have vanished. I've been contacting him at his regular email at his website, and he's not replying. So I've been trying to get his address so I can actually thank him and send him the book. So. Okay. Well, I'm going to stay in touch in the meantime and try to get you back on here for the. Uh, next book that you got coming out when it comes out, uh, I'm pretty sure that Warwick or New Page will let me know. <laughs> oh, they'll, be, they'll be happy to say, everybody who's sort of been sent previous books, I'll send you a copy of the new one as well. Right. Oh, cool. That sounds nice. But uh, yeah, I definitely want to get you on here to talk about it because there's a lot of interest in Area 51 too. And uh, Well, you're a great source of information. I love your research. Oh, well, thank you. All righty. Well, we just had the stream end so I'm going to go ahead and uh, cut us down for the night, and I'm going to go join my wife and rest my back. Nick, it's been a right pleasure here. as usual. You go enjoy your dinner, and we'll stay in touch. Uh, many black cases where it comes to the government. I think the government, there's absolutely no doubt that government agencies know there's a weird and many black mystery, because one of the things I include in the book is a very important document which shows how in the 1960s the Air, U.S. Air Force circulated Throughout the entire Air Force, a document stating that it had come to their attention that there were strange people running around the country impersonating government agents and silencing witnesses to the to UFOs, and, and the government wanted to know who they were. So ironically, you know, you have this situation where those of us in the UFO community back then thought the men in black were the government, and now we find official documents showing that the government was sitting around asking, who are the men in black? So I think what's happened is that over time, the government, to protect its tracks and, its, and to cover its activities when it comes to their covert investigations of people in the UFO research community, I think they've actually exploited and utilized this weird and many black motif to the point where government personnel may actually have you know, sort of worn the strange makeup as it bizarre as it sounds and the badly fitting wigs and you know, acted really strange but as a means to get information out of people, but also by doing that, it kind of ensures that people won't speak out because the stories sound so weird. And, you know, that, that covers their tracks far better than turning up, you know, and flashing an official Pentagon ID card or whatever, where it would be easy to track the person down. So 
I think the government is happy to promote the weird uh, MIB angle because, you know, it, it serves the purpose of camouflage from their perspective if they try and exploit it and use it. Right. You know, that kind of reminds me of a uh, man named Jack Smith that I know that used to always tell me when I worked for him that he never told a lie where the truth fit better. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, uh, that's not right, exactly you know. the same, but it kind of brings it to mind. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, you know, this is government agencies from a, like a psychological war pers warfare perspective are very good at sort of face, skinny, almost anorexic looking, um, you know, white to the point of seeming anemic almost. Um, the reports of them wearing, it sounds crazy, but wearing sort of badly fitting wigs and makeup to try and make the face look more pink-like and, and healthy. Um, they don't seem conversant with our ways and customs very much. And, and in many respects, when you listen to the stories and the witnesses, it actually sounds like this particular breed of MIB are almost alien themselves, but to the point where they look kind of like us and with a few subtle camouflage things here and there, you know, they can move amongst us. Now, in saying that, there's then a third category where they sound more paranormal, where, you know, and supernatural, they don't even sound completely flesh and blood. They have these sort of occult overtones to them almost, almost where people who have experiences with the MIB report poltergeist activity in the house days later, or the MIB literally appear and vanish in the blink of an eye. Things like this. So, so in other words, I don't think there's one brand of MIB. I think the phenomenon itself is sort of made up of a whole variety of phenomena, some of which might be interlinked. And in some cases, I think the government may have actually exploited the weirder men in black mythology as a means to cover their own tracks. So this is why it becomes so confusing and convoluted, if you like. So, you know, pretty much basically... Uh, I get the impression from listening to you and reading your book that, in your opinion, you feel like, uh, at least as far as the ones that the government are concerned with or where they have an involvement, uh, they're not really maybe perhaps so much interested in uh, trying to put a stop to UFO investigation or uh, even really to cover it up so much as to uh, maybe highlight it or maybe put their own angle on it or or keep it going for ulterior motives, maybe? Or, or am I misunderstanding that? You mean the men in black mythology? Yeah. yeah I think what's happened with some, uh, certainly with, there's no doubt, with some uh, using and exploiting mythology and folklore as a means to, you know, um, perpetrate a particular aim or goal. In this case, collecting information but giving away nothing about your real identity, but couching that real identity in something that's so bizarre that people just won't believe it if you mention it. Right. Or not a, coming out and saying you're a man in black, but leading you to believe they're one. Yes, but the, the important thing is that they've based their imagery, if you like, on existing reports of these legitimately mm. very strange men in black that I think they're still trying to track down who they are properly. Yeah, and I remember in your book you was mentioning, and just a minute ago you said it too, that a lot of this had its start way back in the 1940s, I believe it was. I remember reading it was really pretty close to the uh, Kenneth Arnold and uh, Roswell accounts. It's about the same time the men in black were just about to start being born or, or close to it, is it? Isn't it? Yeah, that's right. I mean, in you know, in this sort of post-1947 era with Roswell, Kenneth Arnold, things like that, a lot of people, not just the government, but a lot of people, you know, in the, in, the, in the general public got involved um, in UFO research. One of those who took a, a deep interest in UFOs in the early years was a man named Albert Bender, who grew up in Bridgeport, uh, Connecticut. And Bender developed a, a deep interest in UFOs, sort of post-Kenneth Arnold, etc. And it culminated in the early 1950s when he set up a UFO group um, in Bridgeport called the International Flying Saucer Bureau. And the IFSB actually grew to proportions that I'm pretty sure even Bender himself never really anticipated the group reaching. I mean, it, it really sort of captured people's imaginations to the point where not only in the U.S. Did, it, did his group receive massive coverage and subscriptions, but even had chapters in Australia and England and all wow. over the place. And so he got pretty big. <laughs> oh, yeah. But what was even weirder 
was that although the group sort of reached, Matt asked them about some of the classic cases and what they thought of them and the people involved at the time, and equally importantly, point out to people that there are as many, many black cases going on today as there were, you know, in the past. Um, it's, it's sort of like a misconception that the many blacks simply went away. They didn't. I think what's happened is that a lot of the cases have just gone under the radar today because people are kind of reluctant about talking about them. So that's what I tried to do was sort of correct that balance and try and get people to speak out about, you know, more modern day cases as well as the older ones. Which would also give you a better look at them as you could get more to go on. I mean, I noticed yeah. that in, in your book, you were noticing that uh, the men in black that were in one category actually had an MO that might differ from a, a men in black from a different category, uh, like they each had their own agenda, for example. Yeah, that's right. And I think, you know, the, the, this is one of the most important things that I can think, I can stress to people is that, you know, the men in black aren't just this or that. You know, there seems to be several categories of MIB. Um, and certainly, you know, the, the one that everybody thinks of is the government angle. And as I point out in the book, there's absolutely no doubt that some men in black, you know, are government agents who, because particularly in the 40s, 50s and 60s, you know, they wore black suits. They wore the typical fedora, Homburg-type hats, you know, that you would see in old films with, you know, Frank Sinatra or Humphrey Bogart, Bogart or whatever. You know, so that they kind of look like the part of the MIB. Um, and there's no doubt, you know, that some of the MIB reports and stories and legends can be traced back to government agents. You know, I do point that out in the book. There's some, there's some cases you can actually prove they were government personnel because the documents are surfaced through the Freedom of Information Act. But as well as the regular kind of government MIB, the more prevalent ones are far stranger. They're kind of described as usually sort of five feet to five feet, five feet five tall, very pale. me a book and I read that book and I didn't put it down almost until I finished it except to go to sleep. <laughs> well, thanks. Sir. I guess that's a good, that's a good sign. <laughs> well, I had to keep going back to it. <laughs> Even if I did go to bed, I had to go back to it until I finished it because, I mean, there's just so much in there and so many different uh, theories. And I'll be honest with you, I've delved into the uh, Men in Black before myself on the Internet but I don't think I came up with quite all that information that you came up with. And I was like, wow. But you go to the newspapers and uh, actual, uh, actually talk to the people that were involved if they're still alive and, you know, things of this nature. Am I correct? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think a lot of people, when it comes to the Men in Black, their perceptions are sort of largely created out of the, the Men in Black films, you know, with Tommy Lee Jones and Will Smith. The idea that the Men in Black are just solely government investigators running around the country silencing UFO witnesses. And as I point out in the book, you know, that there's no doubt that that is a part of the Men in Black puzzle. But the weirder thing is that there seems to be several aspects to the Men in Black. In other words, you know, it's not a case of who are the Men in Black. It's more of a case of which Men in Black are you talking about. There seems to be several categories. And you know, also a lot of people have kind of assumed that the Men in Black mystery is very much like a historical one, you know, going back to the 40s and 50s and 60s, and that's where it begins and ends, without a kind of realisation that, in, in reality, that it's, it's a very much an ongoing phenomenon, not just one of the past. And so when I decided to sort of write the book and, and readdress the mystery of the Men in Black, you know, I felt that if I'm going to do that, you know, I've got to go back and speak to the people who are still around, who who were around, still around now, who were around back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. You know, get their views on record, 